Hi everyone, welcome and I hope you're enjoying the Phys Ed Summit. My name is Daniel Hill, coming to you from the beautiful bluegrass state of Kentucky. I have a few of my friends here, then all of which are, um, I've reached out on social media with them uh, because of things that they've posted and uh, expert in their field. Uh, they are going to introduce themselves uh, and share what they do uh, in a minute. My name is Kyle Bragg and I'm from Scottsdale, Arizona. <laughs> Hey, I'm Eric, and I'm from Waukee, Iowa. I'm Jared Prince, and I'm from Clinton, Iowa. So I really appreciate you guys. Uh, we were going to share this session at uh, SHAPE National Conference, uh, but unfortunately, uh, we're all in the same situation of things being closed down because of the uh, coronavirus, so uh, we thought we'd share it with you. So I will share my screen and um, make sure that you all can see it. Uh, the title of this session is, that's not me, that's my email, I don't want to show you that, is the four C's of learning. The four C's stands for create a calm classroom culture. So the benefits of that, uh, there are a lot, but um, the reason why we wanted to share that with you is because um, we've all had some successes with it in, in our classrooms, and um, we're all going to get into it, but we do have a few objectives today. We've all introduced ourselves. Um, I will leave that up at the end so everyone can connect with us on social media. Um, first, we definitely want to describe the how we have all implemented uh, these calm, calming techniques into our classes. Uh, definitely want to explore some of the uh, social emotional learning aspects of it. And uh, today we definitely want to give you some resources. Uh, we want to be practical with your time. Um, and hopefully at the end you'll have just a bank of resources that you can implement these calm classroom techniques into your, um, into your classroom. No matter what age that you teach, uh, elementary, middle, high, doesn't really matter. All these techniques would, would totally be fine with each uh, each grade. So Kai, I believe you're up. Yeah, first of all, I wanna say how uh, social emotional learning can easily be embedded into physical education. I think we are unique in that and a lot of activities we do, we can easily just add a couple things here and there and get more out of the students. So as you can see, this there's a, a SELPE overlap from Shape America and Castle, and it shows how to um, connect and align the standards to social emotional competencies. So when we think of standard two, we'll think of concepts and principles and strategies, but there's also some self-awareness and self-efficacy self and, and a growth mindset. So if you can hit all of those, that'd be even better. So, and there's more on my blog on the bottom there, we'll share that later, but there's specific ways to embed those and the activities to get those reached. So here's just the uh, part of the um, free resource, the cross block from Shape American Castle. As you can see, standard two, we talked about self-advocacy before. There's some self-management and um, there's ways to set up classes where they can uh, manage their emotions and they might go to the calm corner, they might breathe for uh, 10 deep breaths, things that they can do to calm themselves down. Here's a nice visual from Casey Barclay and Joe Birch. Appreciate that. When you're setting up um, a classroom environment, what I try to do is build that community first. Um, try to get those relationships built between the teacher and students, between students and students, have those icebreakers. And then there's, you can't start with trust because they don't trust you, right? So you got to build that connection first. And then everything else will come natural and easier because you have that foundation built. So as we go to the next slide, I'll show you a couple ways to help build that. I do a lot of partners, uh, a lot of random partners through Class Dojo, but you can also do those within um, Team Shake. But what I want to have, have happen is students accepting their partners. They want to be included. They want to be open-minded. They'll feel safe emotionally. So let's say they get paired with somebody they don't, they don't know. This is the standard on the bottom, working with others. How do they show that they appreciate that person? Are they going to be level one? This is from Barb Borden, by the way, that created these partner acceptance levels. Are they level one and getting upset? Or are they level four and cheering on? And uh, think about how you would feel if somebody saw that they were your partner and they cheered when they saw your name. It's pretty cool. So that's one way that I get the, um, instead of just working with their best friends all the time, 
they get random partners and then they work well with that partner because they're happy to be with them. So here's a video, um, we'll go ahead and play here. Getting to know our partners today, so they roll it, they do the exercise of whatever they roll, and they ask their partner that question. So a lot of good discussions here, learning about new people, finding new friends, what they have in common, some social emotional learning here in PE, having fun with somebody new, making new friends. All right, so beyond their best friends, they were already randomly partnered randomly paired, and this is from TJ from Arizona and Adam Clark, but there's lots of variations called dice breakers. So not only are they working uh, with the partner, they're getting to know them, but let's say they rolled a two, they would do the two exercise uh, gift that was on the board, and then they would talk about their favorite superhero power. And um, maybe they found out that their partner really liked to, or really would love to have the ability to fly. And they talk about why, and then maybe you also would love to fly like I would. Um, and then all of a sudden you learn something about them and you have this connection and bond and maybe you want to be partners with them again or maybe play with them again at recess. So um, it just gets the, the kids to know each other and beyond their best friends. And you'll, it's pretty cool to see those connections continue on the rest of the year. So, so Kyle, I, I got a quick question. Uh, when you're facilitating those, um, you know, how to pick a partner and things like that, do you do it kind of typically at the beginning of the year or, throughout the year multiple times a year and if I've, I've had students that just really struggle with this uh, have you developed any kind of procedures to help you know the kid that really struggles with finding a partner or that person uh, I don't want to be with that person I don't want to be that person um, any, any tips yeah we we all practice each level um, there's four levels so I tell them there's one time and one time only you can practice the level one and just for kind of like just to be silly and once they get out, that out of their system, um, we, we practice how good it feels to get that level three and four. And it also takes the anxiety out of it. There's always those one or two kids that don't really have friends or don't know who to get uh, you know, paired up with or to pick. And all of a sudden there's no anxiety anymore because everyone's gonna have a partner. And if we have an odd number, there's gonna be a group of three and we practice like pulling them into our group. And it's pretty cool because um, no one is left out there. So instead of worrying about who's my partner gonna be, we've all had those, um, lessons where, okay, we're going to be in partners and they all kind of look at who their partner is going to be. And there's always a, a kid that doesn't have one. So I think, um, you know, but making that an expectation, that's an expectation in our class and it's directly aligned to those standards, right? Working with others. So um, there's even a standard that uh, works well with people that are less skilled, right? So you got to be open-minded and, and be more of a coach or leader in that sense. Here well, and I mean, talk about Kyle creating, creating that culture um, of where students are buying in because they feel heard, right? They feel listened to, they mm -hmm. feel like they have a voice. And if that's coming from the top down, right? If you're starting that program, um, if you're teaching them those things and putting them in, in those situations, uh, you, you know, they're gonna have the opportunity to practice that and it's just gonna get better and better. Yeah, we're all equals, including me. If I make a mistake, I admit it. There, you know, we talk about things like that. So we're all equals. This next video is called Line Your Mainers. It's from Randy Spring, an amazing activity. Um, you'll play, just a, play a little bit of it. So you'll notice once they win, they literally get out of the way oh, okay. and let the other person pass. And I'm just, I just think it's a cute. Um, so they're practicing locomotors, they're skipping on the line or crack. Once they intersect with somebody, they play, they, first of all, they greet them. They uh, say, their say their name and say, uh, nice to see you, shake their hand. And then they play rock, rock paper, scissors. And the winner shows empathy, another one of those uh, social emotional competencies um, and allows the other person to pass. And you'll be amazed how important that, how long that lasts. They're gonna remember that. They're gonna, doing this, I do, this is one of the few activities I do twice a year. I think it's just so powerful, and here's those three great level outcomes, and, and there's also more, but here's a possible reflection question that reminds me, every activity that you do, there's got to be a purpose, and there's got to hopefully be some sort of reflection question that they can talk about with a neighbor, because if, if there's not that, there's not going to be that deeper learning that you want, so be intentional with why you're doing it, and have that plan ahead of time, that way they can reflect on what they're doing and why they did it. 
this first le left video, a kid was injured, and I collaborated with a nurse to figure out what she could and could not do. So instead of just sitting there, you can pause it right there. So you can notice that smile on their face. She, she was bopping around. She was injured, but her arm was injured, and I knew that because I talked to the nurse, and she just... Now we're trying to connect happiness and these memorable moments to PE because she was um, being that leader with my microphone and giving people opportunity to compliment other people. Um, she, that's a memorable moment. That was a couple of years ago and she st still talks about that. And now all of a sudden she remembers she did that in PE and she's going to enjoy movement and PE and how much you want to bet she can be excited to come to PE next class. So um, that was a cool thing, but you, that's something you have to kind of plan ahead for instead of having them just sit out, have them uh, engage and then, but she was a big part of why we were successful that day, and um, I was really proud of her. On the right-hand side is my uh, wall of fame, and I get kids to write their name up there for going above and beyond, not skill-wise, but those social-emotional uh, components, such as always considering other people's feelings, maybe pulling someone into their group when they don't have they had an odd number, pulling, pulling, pulling. Um, that, that's above and beyond. I have them write their name up because that is going to make it more memorable for them. They're going to remember that the whole, the whole school sees that. So it's a pretty cool thing. Real quick at the top, you'll see it says you will be teaching and learning. You're, they're not just learning in PE. There's so many opportunities that we empower our students to teach, especially when they have more experience, not better, but more experience. And then that, that's, uh, let's say Dan is really experienced at yoga and I'm really experienced at basketball. At yoga, he's going to help me at basketball, I'm gonna return the favor and help him. And here's just kind of a summary of each one of those competencies and how you can um, embed those terms and activities into your classroom. And you'll be amazed how, long, how well your class does with all these other grade level outcomes if those are established early. Oh, man, that's good stuff. I want to come observe your class sometime out in the desert. So it'd be awesome. Happy to have uh, you. <laughs> well, uh, I, first I want to talk about uh, real briefly, uh, the whole title of the session is, is creating that calm uh, classroom climate. What happens when you're not calm? Uh, so physiologically, what happens to your body when you are experiencing trauma, when you're under stress, anxiety? kind of like the world right now uh, because of this virus. Uh, when students come back to the building level school, I think there's gonna be some, a lot of issues with that. Uh, so as you can see on the screen, your body kind of reacts in that fight, flight, freeze mode. Um, the, the, the reason why I shared this with you is because when our bodies, uh, not just the students, but uh, adults too, when our bodies are in this mode, your brain shuts off. You're, you're, you're not ready to learn. And our job as educators is physiologically, as best we can, get them in a state ready to learn. And using these calm techniques, segue there, um, does the opposite. It activates the parasympathetic nervous system. It's the calming part of your, 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 your body. Um, this is what your brain is ready to just be a sponge when you're in this state. Uh, doing these techniques, as you can see on the screen, physiologically, there's a lot of data on it. We don't have time to go in it now, but research it a little bit. Uh, it's, as Kyle said, it's, it's, it's all based on standards and uh, based on science too. So um, I wanna rapid fire some resources to you um, and feel free to connect with us uh, after the session and uh, find us on social media to ask any, any questions on any of these resources that we share. First and foremost, I would not be here without the guys that you see on the screen, the Holistic Life Foundation. They're based out of Baltimore. Um, they do yoga and mindfulness uh, in uh, at-risk schools, at-risk populations. And uh, they do amazing trainings, uh, TED Talks, look them up. They're fabulous, fabulous guys. Um, another re uh, great resource, um, I'll, move my, I'll move our faces, <laughs> is mindful.org, uh, another fabulous, Tons of resources that you get a lot of research on there, a lot of articles. As you can see, you can get a pretty neat uh, little gif that I think Eric's gonna uh, share a little bit later. Um, tons of resources, mindful.org, I use it a lot. Um, for the yoga side, um, my homeroom teachers, I share this a lot. Uh, this is Yoga Foster. Uh, yoga Foster is a nonprofit. She's based out of New York. Uh, she does uh, yoga and mindfulness in schools. Uh, she particularly uh, targets uh, 
Title I schools and low-income schools to get uh, yoga and mindfulness training to the staff, and in other words, to get it to the students. Um, I share this, this uh, picture a lot. As you can see, there on your screen is a big mat of yoga mats, a big cart of yoga mats. And Yoga Foster, what they do, they try to gather donations and they might get used mats. And if you qualify uh, for some grants and if you are a, a school that has an at-risk population, uh, you can get mats for free. So we all love that, that, that magic word of free. So uh, check out Yoga Foster. Another fabulous resource is Yo Mind. Uh, Yo Mind, um, she's based out of uh, Oregon, I believe. Um, Libby Edson is her name. Um, as you can see on the screen, tons of different resources that you can pull from her site. But the one that by far helps my students the most is is the resource that you see on the screen. Um, Libby and Yo Mind uh, coordinated with this gentleman to record some some meditations. And some of my students, when I was presenting this stuff, they were checked out. They, they, it's just what Mr. Hill was saying, eh, I'm, I'm not really into it, until they saw someone that looked like them. Saying what I was saying, and then it clicked. They started listening, and it made a difference. Young, beautiful man, he's, 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 his, his meditations are fabulous. He's really good at what he does, and you can find him uh, at Yo Mind. You know, Dan, you say, you say that uh, um, I know a lot of uh, schools around where I am have had success at bringing some instructors in. And part of that success is, you know, the, uh, the instructors that they're bringing in kind of look like the population of the children that they're serving. And it just, it has so much more of an impact. Um, and, and they've been really successful and, uh, you know, contacting those people and they're bringing in yoga mats. They're bringing in all the materials for entire schools around here of, of students to take part, uh, in some of these yoga sessions. It's been really cool to see. I'm glad because, uh, it's out there. The resources are out there and hopefully you can, um, keep researching. And, uh, again, we'll share at the end, um, definitely these resources will help your students and help you too. Uh, goes in is a great YouTube channel. Um, has some neat little animations as you can see on the screen uh, and some guided meditations. Uh, they're relatively short. So um, great, great YouTube channel. I use it a lot toward the end of a lesson. Just throw it up uh, a goes in YouTube. Um, and that, it, my students really enjoy it. Uh, would be remiss if it did not say the Health Moves Minds from Shape America. Uh, their calendars and the thing that that program that is is been coming out definitely heavy with with mindfulness. Um, guys, if uh, you all know anybody, uh, I personally have not done Health Moves Minds at my school, but Kentucky has had some really good leaders uh, that have been implemented Health Moves Minds, and I know. Uh, do you all know of anybody that's had some really good successes? Yeah, Todd. Todd from Kentucky. He's a. He's a. I message him quite often just to get some ideas, and he's very passionate about it and, and enjoyed it. And I know there are some people on the eastern side of the state, uh, kind of around the Iowa City area in eastern Iowa, that are um, pretty heavily involved with Health Moves Minds, or, or at least getting started. And so, um, and but you know that's kind of what it takes is. It's kind of getting started in one place or, you know, in one part of uh, the state. And then uh, hopefully it'll just continue to grow from there. Yeah, just huh. piggyback, piggyback off of Eric, the Iowa City really took the lead for the state of Iowa as far as health move, moves minds is going here. Yeah, just this, the understanding that kids need to address their mental health as much as their physical health. Um, it's, it's what it's all about. It's the reason why we're sharing what we're sharing today. And again, like you said, you know, in, in the time that we're in right now, coming back to school in the fall or whatever that looks like, I mean, this is going to be more important than ever, <laughs> seemingly, you know. Here, like, here's hoping. <laughs> here's hoping. Uh, another uh, resource uh, is from Open. Uh, we wrote a uh, module 
on yoga and mindfulness. Um, pull those resources. Uh, I love putting it up there and I share these things a lot with my, my, my parents. Uh, when I did uh, bring your hero to PE or bring your parent to PE week, a lot of these academic language cards from open were, were around. And I would just simply point to it because I would, they would ask me, what are you learning in PE? What are you doing? And I said, there, look at that. We're learning how to be calm, but that's, it, that's different. That what? That's different. Uh, and those resources from open, um, I enjoy them. So uh, here's a tag game from open past the pose. Uh, so you would laminate these, these uh, yoga poses and uh, you know, you would do a tag game. If I tag you, you have to do the yoga pose until I run out of cards and then you can become the tagger. So it's a fun little tag game that implements uh, yoga poses um, gets that little bit of a calm uh, environment and, and kind of an exciting <laughs> tag game too. So I uh, hope it has some great resources. Really quick, I love the diversity here. And then also what you could do is you could also take pictures of your own kids doing it and putting it up there. And, and even when they explain what mindfulness is, you can have your kid's name in it. That's going to make it more uh, meaningful and relevant, relevant for them. I think for anybody that's just getting started with mindfulness, the open resource is fantastic. I would really advocate for that. My students really enjoyed this resource. Uh, it was really easy to start and everything in there is really high quality. So if you're just getting start with, started with mindfulness, I really suggest the open resource. I took those, uh, took some of those cards from open and, and threw them in my, uh, my dice that uh, have the pockets. And, you know, so then we'd roll and do different poses and have kind of a yoga pose off, turn it into a competition. You know, I mean, buy-in was huge. The kids were loving it and having a great time. Well, speaking of those resources from, from open, I hope uh, your students have, haven't made fun of my Kentucky twang very much when I recorded these uh, uh, guided meditations and put on open site. Uh, hope, I've, I've had some messages where are you from, son? Because I just got this trying. I'm kidding. <laughs> I hope these resources, you can just calm down and simply just click play. I mean, how easier, how much easier does it get? You just click one of these guided meditation. They're about three minutes. Try them at the end of class. Uh, speaking of end of class, any of these poses work. Uh, you can do these in a chair. Do these on a cushion. Or, or you can be like this teacher and just lay flat because wow uh, so Kyle you mentioned before uh, calm corner um, so how how has that worked for you um, and in, you guys you all can jump in here this has been absolutely transformative for some of my students you know I've got students from a lot of different trauma a lot of different backgrounds and when I see them they're bringing that baggage with them so my lesson isn't you know, the top of their priority right now. So they might need a space to go and just chip. So how have y'all had success with Tom Corner? And I, I'm glad you mentioned that. that. That's part of building the community, right? You're not in trouble when you go there. We're a family, you understand it. Dan, if, you're, if your son was, you know, feeling down, you would help him. So we're going to help whoever's feeling down. But first of all, they need to have their time to themselves and I have a, a sand timer for one minute so I allow them to do it for one or they can twist it and do it for two minutes that way they're not staying there for the whole lesson um, and then they kind of pick and that's another voice choice to give them the more you can give them choices the better kind of what Kyle's talking about um, I struggled a little bit with um, a consequence for actions and oh it always felt like a punishment for sending students out of the activity but using this calm corner and the resources i have there i have the sand timer as well it's really let students know that no i'm not in trouble i am just being silly or i'm just off task or whatever it may be i need to calm down center myself and then return back to the activity and it's at their pace so whenever they're ready to come back yeah i think kyle you mentioned the the sand timers uh those have really helped. Uh, some people have reached out and uh, are they, they want to go there? I said, well, they might need to go there. Uh, it's not a want kind of thing. I, it's a procedure that I teach day one uh, and students really need it and uh, seem to gravitate toward it. So, 
And that's um, directly aligned to those standards, right? That self uh, management and controlling your emotions. And, and also that's a lifelong skill. You're going to be frustrated at times, whether you don't get a job or whatever, you have to be able to uh, cope with that. So uh, ingraining in that, uh, grading that in their minds early in elementary school is huge. When I started with social emotional skills and trying to teach those on a daily basis, I found responsive classroom and that has drastically helped how I go about just re teaching every day. This is ingrained in how I um, handle myself as a teacher how I interact with students, and how I teach social emotional skills. So here's a quick discussion question you can use in the chat just to go over, but how can we use empathy when responding when students are misbehaving? Now, go, go ahead and move to the next. Now, responding to misbehaviors is, you don't want it to be noticeable. You don't want students to know that you're the other students to know you're responding to the student when they might be talking or anything that might be disruptive to their learning. You want it to be quick, you want it to be noticeable, and you want to let that student know that they're off test and need to come back on. So if you see a student talking, for example, you could just move closer to them. That proximity allows that student to realize, hey, I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be. Maybe I should listen to what Mr. Prince is talking about. You can use visual cues. Sometimes some of my students just like to stand up and I just tap my two fingers together and that's just letting them know you need to sit back down. Or I can put my fingers to my lips, letting them know that they need to be listening and not talking. Um, I also use what's re called redirecting language and that's part of responsive classroom. If I ever need to use my voice to respond to the misbehavior, I want it to be decisive and I want it to be quick when I speak to them so they know to get back on task right away. So whether, whatever it may be, that redirecting language should re reflect what they're doing. So re remember, be patient, respond with teaching in mind, and make sure it's quick and to the point so you can get onto learning and onto the activity. So another discussion question, I'm just throwing these in here. You can talk about them if you'd like, but um, it's right there. I don't like to read things off of it too much, but how do we instill that confidence and competence our students need as teachers? And um, how we do that is um, through interactive modeling. And it's a seven step process, but it should be really quick in how you go about doing it. Basically the seven steps are, and you can take that down to five if you need, but it's basically you're describing what's gonna happen. You would show without much discussion how to do it. You could pick one of your students to show how to do it. And then you would have a class discussion. What did you notice when they, went to go grab a ball and bring it back to their hula hoop. Your, your students would call out a couple, then you could have another student try or you could have the whole class try, but you want it to be interactive. So you're discussing how it looks and talking about what you're noticing and it, it helps the students fully grasp how to do procedures. And I do this right away at the beginning of the year. It's had a lot of success on how we go about procedures and how they should look. Just as simple as getting out of equipment, putting away equipment. And we also do it with social emotional skills, how to find a partner, using self-calming skills at the calm corner, responding with empathy towards others at the conflict corner, whatever it may be, social emotional classroom procedures, we use interactive modeling to do so. And I could discuss this further with you. I don't want to take up too much time talking about this, but I think of all the responsive classroom material that they have, interactive modeling has changed my classroom the most. Well, Jared, and I know, you know, like we talked about earlier, this is in direct correlation with, you know, the social emotional competencies, right? Yes. Yep. Um, Self-awareness, the uh, social awareness, right? Of just, uh, we found that in uh, 
um, uh, my previous school district, you know, we, we, we did a lot of work of uh, where they wanted us to put students in these situations where they're working together in large groups. Um, but they didn't have some of these base social emotional skills and it just wasn't working. So, you know, like we really had to uh, kind of go back to the beginning and start building this foundation and, and, you know, putting them in these safe situations to work on some of these, right. And to build these right. skills up yep. um, before we saw success, you know, in those group situations that uh, they may have been struggling in before. And it's kind of, so going off what Kyle mentioned earlier about his activities that he's doing at the beginning of the year that are directly related to the social emotional skills, interactive modeling. If he sees someone giving an effective compliment during one of those activities, um, I know I do this, but I'm not going to speak for Kyle. You may just stop the class and talk about and discuss that skill, giving that teach, teachable moment there so they can see, see in the, um, all the students can see how important social emotional skills are. So I think this is a good question to just ask yourself is um, how, to, not students aren't always going to be calm and how can they calmly handle those emotions? So um, when you're thinking about that, I use an emotional th thermometer and I have this at my calm corner. So when students visit the calm corner, I might quickly say, hey, you need to go to the calm corner real quick, find yourself and come back. They need to figure out what emotion they're feeling at that time and use that strategy to help them get back to that centered self that they can come back in the activity and learn and be with us without having that emotion that they're feeling right now. So, so, so I, got a, sorry, I got a quick question. Um, have you ever had to do this for yourself? Because <laughs> I know there have been situations where I am not calm. And yeah. in a situation where I'm just frustrated and angry, I've got my own baggage. And unfortunately, a student sees the bad side of me. Uh, have, have you had to go to the calm corner yourself? I actually have interactive modeling. I've used it showing how it should look, how it, how they should use it. But also there, Daniel, me and you would teach in similar schools where our free and reduce and our poverty might be a little higher than other schools. And um, because of that, our students do carry in a lot of baggage and a lot of weight from all the trauma they've been involved with. So there's so many different emotions and at times, classroom management, all I can try to do doesn't have a lot of success and I need to take a deep breath. So if they are, if they ha they're having their day and it is what it is, I just go to the calm work corner, sit crisscross, take a couple deep breaths and then come back to it because it's, it can get you sometimes, but sometimes you yourself need that. Or I just step away, take a couple deep breaths, come back, but Showing them that you know how to use these strategies is also an effective way for them learning how to use them. And sometimes they, instead of sending them to the calm corner, I might say, just go get a drink quick. Cool off, get a drink, come back. Because that might be all they need. So this is a good way of them learning how to handle their emotions, not only during PE, but also at home with their, when they're playing with their siblings or at recess when they're playing a game, whatever it may be knowing your emotions and how to deal with them can only help. So last question for you. Uh, one of my favorite things about responsive classroom is how they end the day. Um, I really struggled at the beginning of my career of ending class calmly and responsive classroom has really helps in how I in, res in class calm, respectful, and sending them back ready to go to their teacher. And I've had good discussions with Kyle about this specifically, but I think um, closing corners, closing circle, sorry, is literally the, has changed the way ending classroom has, ending my classes look. 
it's been very effective. But the best part about it, about it is I leave the last five minutes here, just reflect or celebrate and celebrate if we wanted to, but their learning experience through the day. So we might have a reflection question at the end of the day. They would discuss with their partners that reflection question. We might talk about what they learned today and celebrate that learning. But it's a great manageable manage, management skill to use for you to just have that peaceful send off to your students so they can go back to their room, not just feeling good about themselves, but having that sense of accomplishment and belonging. So like three to five minutes, I always leave that for this. I think it's a great way to bring the excitement towards a lesson. Right there, we're doing a roller coaster cheer, but we have a ton of cheers. I might have like a little um, bowl that a student will pick a cheer out and we'll do that cheer or just go interactive modeling the cheers that we want to do throughout the year. So I could just say, hey, we're doing the roller coaster cheer today and they're all for it. So they love this. I think it's really been transforming as far as ending the day with that calm sense and sending them back, feeling that sense of accomplishment. Well, yeah, so uh, we, we, we talked about earlier, you know, how we wanted this uh, session to be just kind of a wealth of resources, right? And so I thought uh, uh, I'd give an example of uh, a couple of activities that I paired together um, this school year. And uh, again, both of these uh, from Open, uh, and uh, this was um, during one of my observations and, you know, my uh, – principal just commented on uh, how much he loved it, how much uh, he enjoyed um, putting these students into uh, situations where they could practice some of these techniques. And so um, with this one on the left here, this frostbite tag, uh, essentially what that is, is, and you know, this was, this was in Iowa, you know, in the, in the winter, it was super cold. And what, uh, what, what better time to uh, throw this into the mix? So, um, essentially what students were doing is uh, they would get, uh, they would get tagged, right. And they would, they would freeze. And so we talked about, uh, um, you know, in this activity, it talks about, uh, frostbite and what that does to your body. Right. Um, and, and, and things that you need to do to prevent that from happening. And, you know, this came, I found this and this came at a time when, you know, there's a lot of talk about, uh, students walking to school and being safe and um, or waiting outside for the bus when it was really cold and and you know so I wanted to throw this into uh, to give you know an example for them to kind of reinforce uh, safe procedures uh, for them uh, outside as well uh, so what I really love about this though is um, the opportunity for the students to help somebody else out right somebody's stuck, somebody's frozen, right? And so the only way that they're going to get warmed up in this activity is, uh, you know, if somebody comes over to them and wraps an imaginary blanket around them, right? Somebody goes out of their way to say, man, this person's stuck. Like, I need to go help this person. Um, and, you know, and, and it turned into, um, you know, like, oh, I'm going to go give this person a big hug, right? And, 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 you know, it seems crazy, you know, uh, dealing what, with what we are now, but, um, you know, the students were loving it, right? They were, they, they were going over, they saw somebody that they wanted to help and, and, you know, they were really getting into it, really playing it up. It was, it was uh, just fantastic. So uh, then uh, towards the end, I paired it up with this burr, I'm cold activity, right? And uh, so what the students were doing is they were um, kind of adjusting their movement or changing their movement uh, to different temperature levels, right? And so on, on this next slide, I, uh, I threw up uh, the, uh, uh, this different temperature scale, right? This uh, kind of GIF that's moving up and down. So I slowed it down a little bit um, so it would change different temperatures. So the students were, again, uh, uh, going through this movement sequence and uh, uh, adjusting that through that kind of 
uh, a mindfulness activity of what their body feels like when they're exercising and and how they can adjust it and what uh, you know just the the differences in their body between when they're they're freezing or when they're moving a lot and um, so but they uh, again they really enjoyed that I enjoyed pairing both of those together so um, yeah then you can go. now uh, what we did at the end of class that day then you know it was um, I had my students just lay down on the ground right and we uh, we just laid there and I had them think about think about these questions right how did it make you feel when somebody helped you right and somebody came to rescue you went out of their way instead of just running around and trying not to get tagged they kind of sacrificed themselves and their time to come over and help you out how does that make you feel and then uh again the uh the thoughts that you had when when you went and helped somebody right like what what made them want to go out of their way to go help somebody else so again just uh, an example of how um, I use some some of this mindfulness and uh, in one of my lessons so um, a lot of uh, what I have experience with is and, and, and that I've tried to implement uh, in my schools is this program called yoga for classrooms right evidence-based trauma-informed yoga and mindfulness program um, that, that really I've seen have a large effect on the entire school's climate, right? We're, we're, we're talking classroom and, and then branching out into all the classrooms and, and, and having an effect on the culture of your entire building. So um, you can go to the next one. Now, it, as you click through here, I have some pictures, right, of uh, these are things that we did uh, after recess, right? These are things that students did um, after breakfast in the morning, every day, every day. Partner challenges, mindfulness challenges of where they're laying down in a corpse pose and just being still for an increasing amount of time uh, as they as they begin to practice that, right? Students working together, kind of developing that social awareness, right? And kind of working on some of these skills of, of helping each other out. Uh, again, this is happening in the morning, in the afternoon. Students uh, and staff, right? In a, in a staff professional development of um, kind of practicing what they preach and, and, and even at the beginning of the day, right, we have all the students come into the building, they'd come into the gym, and we would work on different breathing techniques, and students would then select uh, kind of their go-to de-escalation technique of, of how they were going to um, handle tough situations or things that they could use when, you know, they had different emotions and different feelings during the day. So. Uh, part of what I did then is uh, with this yoga for classrooms or, you know, there's this, this card deck that uh, comes with it. And we actually ended up uh, developing our own curriculum for school wide. So classroom teachers and, 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 and really teachers throughout the entire building could uh, simply have it right in front of them and know what to go through uh, in, in their classroom. So what I did was I developed um, some of these gifts uh, for teachers to use so they would display these so they could always have an example, um, kind of free them up to move through the classroom and observe students or help students. While students are checking these out, right, um, on the screen for whatever particular pose or breathing technique that they were using that day. Um, I, I have a couple of graphics here that we uh, would share with our students a lot, right? And we think about mindfulness. Uh, are we being mindful of the situation or is our mind full of something else, right? And, and all these different uh, things that would help our students as we try to get them to develop kind of a, a bank of techniques and activities that they could take with them or they could, you know, pull out of their bank at any moment 
when they needed to de-escalate themselves. So, uh, you know, and th this next graphic we talked about a lot, like, are they, uh, um, busy thinking about something else and going and going and going. And, you know, this is, this is adults as well. You know, uh, um, the teachers, you know, we, we thought about this all the time, right. Are we uh, truly taking in the moment or, or are we letting other things dominate that? So, um, Eric, along with this, have you, yeah. Eric, have you seen any students doing this on their own or really buying into it and, maybe practicing a yoga pose when they got frustrated or mad? Yeah, that's what, uh, you know, as you, again, as we start to put students in these situations and teach them these things, they're able to, to go to these, right, to de-escalate. They're able to go to these when they feel stressed um, and kind of work on some of these things and pick out things that are unique to them, right? Because just like you and I have different uh, stress relieving activities and and techniques, you know, we tried to give them just a bunch of different examples um, that they could use uh, really pretty much anywhere. Um, and again, so, some examples here from mindful meditations. Another activity we would do is one student would share, you know, when I feel whatever emotion, here's what I do, right? And again, so they start to develop that bank of, 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 of different things that they can do of, oh, you know, I've never thought about that. Like, I feel frazzled all the time or, Hey, I feel depressed too. Like maybe I could try that technique and Hey, all of a sudden it works for them. Right. Then maybe there's a, a relationship between those um, students of they're doing the same things to uh, relieve their stress. So I really love this. Another example of uh, the uh, mindful minute at the end with some beanie babies focusing on the breathing and the belly work. Um, uh, just a, a really cool example of a, of a fun, engaging, mindful minute for students. So, well, Guys, I really appreciate you uh, sharing your expertise and all your practical experiences with, with this, these calming techniques. And I, I really love seeing actual application of them, uh, seeing kids be calm and seeing adults be calm too. So, gentlemen, thank you very much. Stay calm, stay safe, and appreciate your time. Thank you, guys. Thank you.